everyone uh, should be in the room now. So uh, thank you very much for coming, uh, everybody. Okay, so I'm Fuhito Kojima. So, um, so, we, uh, uh, so today is the first day uh, for this uh, really great lecture series on the uh, uh, analysis of individual uh, markets with individual goods. Okay, uh, all right. So uh, let me just say a few words about this uh, center uh, uh, organizing this. So uh, University of Tokyo Market Design Center uh, is a uh, research center affiliated with, um, with the University of Tokyo. So we made it uh, one year ago. And uh, our purpose is to advance uh, our basic research and also uh, implement, uh, put, basically put the a, a, a research insight uh, into practice, right? So part of the thing that we really want to do is to, uh, well, invite great people like, like we are doing right now and learn, uh, learn from, from them. Okay, so um, I hope that this lecture series will be fun for everybody and uh, uh, we, you know, uh, we hope to do it, uh, do things like this uh, many, many times. Okay, all right. So now um, uh, let's let's go to the uh, uh, this lecture series. Uh, 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 talk about this lecture series, right? Um, so, like I said, uh, so we will have uh, uh, four days of lectures. Um, uh, Professor uh, Ax Tetelborn and uh, Professor uh, Elizabeth Baldwin and Professor uh, uh, Larry Jagadizan. Uh, I think Alex and uh, also Elizabeth is here. Hi, Elizabeth. Great. Um, good. And uh, oh, he uh, and their uh, uh, their close uh, uh, collaborator. Well, uh, Professor Paul Klemper actually joined uh, uh, as audience. So uh, uh, it, uh, we we thank him. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, let me not talk about what this thing is about because that's you know uh, uh, we have uh, we have speakers. So let me just use one remaining minute uh, introducing uh, Professor Alexander Tedebon, right? Uh, who is the first uh, speaker of the first day? Okay. So uh, Alex um, uh, obtained the PhD from uh, Oxford uh, in I think 2013, right? Uh, so he's well. He's, he's very a, a, a very young uh, in the career, but he has been like like producing a lot of really interesting research um, in this short uh, amount of time. And uh, some of them, uh, currently he's an associate professor uh, at Oxford. And so uh, he has been working on very different uh, topics. Um, some of them are, are, are in the environmental issues and uh, very uh, also uh, he has worked on well the uh, quite mathematically inclined i would say um, models of uh, matching and networks uh, some of which i believe that uh, he will talk about uh, today and later this week and uh, um, uh, another uh, another line of research i'm a big fan of uh, in both the, the a practical uh, matching uh, mechanisms of uh, refugees. So the question is to how to match refugees to different places in the country, for example. Okay, as you, uh, everybody knows, that's a big problem in, in uh, these days. And uh, um, this is a natural matching problem. Um, the, there are uh, non-standard resource constraints, uh, which makes the, the uh, standard model to be unapplicable. Uh, so he has a really nice paper on this, and in addition to that, um, uh, he uh, founded a, a non-profit organization, uh, Fiji AI, uh, which actually puts the research insight into helping the, uh, uh, the refugee agencies, uh, actually, in, in practice. So I'm, uh, uh, this is really cool, and I'm sure, I, I'm guessing that this is not going to be a topic for this week, but maybe we should definitely invite him again for this another set of uh, lectures. Uh, but let's let's come back to uh, today's topic. Okay, so okay, I, I oh my god, I should I, I have I, I have already spent five minutes. So uh, let's let's uh, let's uh, let's welcome Professor uh, uh, Tedebon and okay, Alex, um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Perfect. I'm going to share. Oh, sorry, my... just, I just forgot to say one thing. Oh God. <laughs> Please share the slides and uh, yep. why I will talk. Sorry. Um, so we have 90 minutes and uh, followed by, well, 
uh, Q and A like question and answer sessions uh, until like well uh, additional thirty minutes. Uh, you are welcome to also um, the uh, ask uh, questions during the uh, lectures, but um, uh, or just one catch. So the uh, lecture will be uh, recorded, uh, except for this uh, uh, Q and A sessions. So uh, that means if you ask questions during the lectures, uh, your questions will be recorded. Okay, so if you, uh, so that means uh, if you have some sensitive questions, well, I don't know whether or why this can happen, uh, or personal questions, uh, you might want to uh, save it for the uh, last 30 minutes. Okay, so that's the only announcement I want to make. Okay, on that note again, okay, this time really, uh, Alex, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Fajito, and uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Michihiro and Yuchiro for inviting me, um, and Elizabeth and Ravi to give this series of lectures. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be with you all, even though it's not in person, but this is uh, the world we live in now. Um, and it sort of forced me uh, to introduce this topic and give you an overview. And really this lecture, um, I think if you were a little bit uncharitable, you might say it's an extended literature review. I'm hoping to make it a bit more fun than that and try to put some coherence on this vast and we think a very important literature um, and actually set up a lot of the... Um, intellectual framework that we will use um, in the next three lectures. Um, so hopefully that uh, means that by the time Elizabeth and Ravi uh, do their talks, you will have a really good idea of how the results uh, and the approaches fit in what people um, um, have been doing on this topic for about half a century. So um, uh, this is uh, going to be quite um, a, an easy start. What I'll do is actually, I'll talk a little bit at the beginning about general equilibrium. And I'm sure many people on this call have taught and had to study general equilibrium, do problem sets on it. Um, and um, I think actually a very good starting point is going to be trying to remember some of the basic results that we would learn from there. And then I will move on pretty quickly uh, to try to argue that actually markets for indivisible goods are going to be very important in many applications. Um, and um, I will split the lecture into two parts. The first part will deal with a setting um, of markets with indivisible goods where we have transferable utility. And as I will argue, actually, this is an extremely special case, but a case that is really, um, it turns out to be very tractable and very useful in many applications. And then towards the end, and this is in a way that focus of our most recent work, I'm going to talk about the presence of income effects. Um, and um, in the third and the fourth lecture, we will really tackle this problem head on and present some of the uh, newest results um, that we have on this topic. And right at the very end, what I will do is I will sort of put the whole lecture together and give you an idea of what's going to happen uh, in the second, uh, third and, and fourth uh, lectures, um, hoping of course that uh, Ravi and Elizabeth will actually follow suit and do what I will promise you. Okay, so um, um, let me, um, let me um, um, uh, actually just move straight in. I'll give you some notation. This, uh, uh, this lecture is not going to be very notation heavy, but it's worth sort of having all the basic ingredients um, uh, there uh, in your head. And we will try to the extent that's possible, use similar notation across the lectures. Um, if something slip, of course, apologies, but by and large, we hope that the notation is going to be quite consistent so you can keep track of what's going on. So um, we'll have a finite set of N goods and a finite set J of agents um, and uh, agents and goods are going to be finite throughout. Um, and we will think about different feasible consumption bundles for each agent. And of course, um, this is something that's going to vary depending on what environment we're in, whether it's a standard environment um, uh, from general equilibrium or the environment of um, uh, indivisible goods. Um, now, um, agents are going to be endowed with the utility function, which is, you know, uh, you can microfound with some preferences. Um, and uh, agents are also going to have uh, uh, endowments. And of course, when I talk about transferable utility economies, we can put this aside, endowments are not going to matter. Um, but uh, towards the end of this lecture, um, um, endowments are going to play a crucial role. And I'll assume that the endowments um, are going to be sort of feasible um, uh, for the agents. Uh, we're going to have prices. They're going to, they're going to be a price for every good. And uh, hopefully at this point, you can see where I'm going to be going with this. Um, I will have um, a, um, a Marshallian demand, 
and this is just going to be the correspond uh, the standard Marshallian demand correspondence. So that is, it's going to be the set of feasible consumption bundles that will maximize the agent's uh, utility. Okay, defined in a completely uh, usual way. And so the focus of um, certainly the first three lectures, but this will change a bit in Ravi's uh, fourth uh, lecture. Here, I'm going to talk, be talking about competitive equilibrium. So what is competitive equilibrium in our setting? Well, take um, these uh, uh, endowment vectors, right? One ve endowment vector for each agent. Um, so we're going to uh, say that a competitive equilibrium is a pair. It's going to be a, a list of uh, vectors and um, of uh, consumption vectors and a vector of prices such that the um, each agent uh, demands uh, what they have been allocated um, uh, um, in, um, um, in, in the competitive equilibrium and markets for all goods uh, will clear. So the... Excuse me for a moment, Alex. Yes. Uh, it may just be me, but I imagine you want to be sharing your slides and I can't see any slides. Are, are, are you? Uh, I, I am, yes. Okay, so... It, I, I can apologize. see them. Okay, I apologize to the audience. Uh, all I can see is you speaking. I apologize to the rest of the audience for, if, okay. if everyone else can well, see your slides. <laughs> I hope everybody going, else Alex. can. I'm, I'm glad Elizabeth can as well. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going, expecting everybody else. But please uh, shout if something Alex, is... Yes. Alex, I have a clarifying question. Uh, yes, do you restrict... Uh, 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 do you assume that price should be non-negative and uh, yeah, equilibrium condition involves free good or equilibrium, when you say in the definition, all uh, markets for all goods clear, that means demand is exactly, aggregate demand is exactly- Correct, it's going to be exactly, yes, exactly. Oh, so I'm okay. going to- So um, some so prices may be negative. Indeed. So in okay. principle, I'm going to allow for negative prices. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, Mitchell, you might uh, uh, be annoyed by this. I'm going to be a little bit hand wavy in this lecture just because mm -hmm. there is a lot of possible assumptions otherwise yeah. to introduce. Yeah. Yeah. So when we're going to come for the second, third and fourth lecture, we will be much more precise. Okay. Here, for the sake of overview, I'm going to be a little bit loose. And so Good. some you know, excellent question. By all means, clarify. But very often I will say, um, you know, often you need some extra okay. conditions, for example, right, which I'm, I'm not going to state in their entirety, but that's a good, good clarifying question. Here, there's no need for restriction like uh, positive prices, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, if we sort of just recall how we um, um, usually set up our um, uh, general equilibrium problem, we uh, typically assume that, of course, goods are perfectly divisible, and indeed uh, the, uh, the feasible consumption sets for agents are going to be uh, uh, convex. And we put some conditions on the uh, on a preference or alternatively on the utility function. So we assume convexity of preferences um, and continuity. And so the utility function would um, is often assumed to be uh, continuous, monotone in a particular way um, and uh, concave in a particular way. OK, so um, um, in addition, um, we often need to uh, introduce extra conditions uh, on the endowments and the condition I've written down here that um, all the endowments are positive is actually much stronger than what you need. And a, a lot of the general equilibrium literature has worked very hard to relax this condition. Um, um, and indeed, even if you open Masculine, Winston and Green, they will give you various alternative um, uh, formulations um, 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 uh, uh, for this problem, different assumptions uh, on the endowments. But we do need some conditions uh, on endowments to uh, make sure that uh, a competitive equilibrium actually exists in this nice uh, convex economy. So I'm going to now tell you about six results that are, if you like, canonical results from general equilibrium that you will find in virtually any graduate level textbook uh, on this uh, topic by now. And the first one, of course, is that equilibrium exists under weak conditions, kind of roughly the conditions that I have specified on the previous slide, indeed much weaker often than that. And these results were initially proved by Ara, De Brer, um, and Mackenzie in that famous uh, issue of Econometrica in 1954. So since then, of course, people have spent a lot of time trying to analyze the different properties uh, of competitive uh, um, equilibria. And in particular, one of the rather beautiful results 
um, uh, um, um, is that the number of uh, equilibrium price vectors turns out to be finite. This is a generic result, right? So um, um, if we slightly perturb the economy, we will find that the number of equilibrium price vectors is going to be finite. And indeed, it turns out to be odd. So this, um, again, follows from um, uh, the result in index theory. Um, and um, um, on a more negative note, um, in fact, what happens in general equilibrium is that the, um, the aggregate demand does not really tell you very much about what's going to happen to individual demand. So, you know, the way to maybe one way of thinking about what general equilibrium is, is to specify aggregate demand and see where um, and, and, and try to, to, to clear aggregate demand. But actually this aggregate demand, this object, play, uh, doesn't really tell us much about what's going on. So there's a, um, there's a, a famous um, sort of anything goes theorem due to Zonenshine, Mantle and De Brewer, um, which um, you know, essentially says that um, you can have more or less anything you want with aggregate demand. And in other words, it also means that equilibrium actually entails very few um, restrictions on the set of equilibrium prices that you can possibly get. So equilibrium itself is not a particularly strong condition. You can't learn um, uh, much uh, from it, uh, uh, from um, um, how the set of equilibrium prices uh, might look. The fourth result is much older. In fact, it's really the insight, this insight really goes back to Walrus and Edgeworth. Um, and it is that the core, so this is um, um, going to be um, the um, allocations that a group of agents cannot uh, improve on by deviating and reallocating resources among themselves. That set is going to be much larger than the set of competitive equilibrium allocations. And of course, the um, the, the, the famous Edgeworth conjecture was that as the economy gets large, these two things uh, end up coinciding, and Alman proved a, a, a beautiful result about that. And that's been a, that, that, um, um, and of course, this is what we often uh, see inside an Edgeworth box, right? So inside an Edgeworth box, we have the core, which is usually um, the points that lie on the contract curve above the um, um, above the um, endowment utility levels, um, and um, a competitive equilibrium prices are usually a point. And this is, um, and so you can really see this um, uh, graphically. Now, the fifth um, uh, important point is that finding equilibrium in a natural way is actually very difficult. So, if you would like a tautonomon process, so a process whereby I announce price vectors, agents report their demand, and we adjust prices. Uh, consequently, to ensure that we can actually get to equilibrium from a process like this, we're going to need to put stronger conditions on preferences. And in general, Tatonomont is going to work. So Tatonomont works, for example, if uh, aggregate demand satisfies the weak axiom of real preference or it satisfies uh, gross substitutability. But otherwise, you might end up cycling um, um, around equilibrium um, or away from equilibrium. So you you, um, uh, in, uh, typically you're not going to be able to reach it. So um, it's therefore not exactly obvious how equilibrium is actually reached because uh, Tatanomon might seem like a natural process to get to it. So if uh, we don't have it, then um, uh, you might ask, you know, how do we get to equilibrium? And the other side of this point is that computing equilibrium, if you are a social planner, computing equilibrium in a general equilibrium setting is hard. And I, again, uh, with apologies, I'm not going to specify exactly what hard means. Um, um, the, the kind of first attempt at, at this problem was made by Scarf, who spent, um, um, you know, a lot of time and, and wrote some beautiful papers about how to do these computations. But the formal um, treatment of this problem in computer science um, the foundations of it were, is due to, uh, um, um, uh, comes from a paper by Papa Dimitriou um, in the mid 90s who identified the appropriate complexity class uh, for this problem. And indeed, uh, computing equilibrium prices is, um, 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 is hard um, computationally typically. So please keep these six points in mind because I'm going to come back to them at the very end. And I will show you the contrast that you get between divisible good settings and indivisible good settings. And a good uh, point uh, to use would actually be these, uh, these, uh, these six points. Okay, so Maskell, Winston and Green um, themselves actually say that the most substantial assumption that they've made while laying out conditions for existence of equilibrium concerns convexity. So um, 
You've been warned. It's in fact sitting in our most uh, famous textbook that convexity um, is indeed uh, an issue. And in fact, from a point of view of uh, an economist studying the world, you actually find that many markets are very thin and uh, they involve trade of heterogeneous goods. Now, of course, general equilibrium assumes that uh, that things are very commodified and the markets are very thick. There is a lot of traders and, and sellers um, um, and that and then the goods um, um, the the goods are divisible and they essentially kind of uh, you know look like very homogeneous commodities. And so there's no, no there's no real important role for indivisibilities, but they do um, in general, in many markets play a very important role. So uh, one place um, which is very obvious, and I'll come back to this several times, is models in which goods are truly very indivisible. Um, so a house might be a, a good example of that, or a used car. And so models of exchange um, um, where you, you really cannot divide goods up and clearly every house is different from every other house. Um, um, an assumption of uh, both indivisibility and heterogeneity is going to play an important role. Now, famously, the abilities comes up in market design and in particular in design of auctions. So when spectrum uh, slots come on sale, even though spectrum itself is a divisible good, in order to sell spectrum, spectrum is often divided up into very specific chunks, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 lots, uh, kind of big lots of spectrum so that a, uh, a company typically buys a big sort of um, um, a swathe of spectrum that it can send data on. Um, and these things are also highly indivisible. There's a few very uh, there's typically very few goods um, on sale um, at any uh, one time, and they're all very heterogeneous. Um, all these slots are going to often have uh, a different, uh, very different value depending on where in the spectrum they sit. Um, and the same thing is also true for ad slots. So typically, an, a, a single ad slot auction is also very thin. So when Google shows you um, uh, their results, there's usually typically only three, you know, two or three adverts there. So these these slots can be, especially the most prominent ones, are going to be um, very much um, uh, indivisible and, um, um, and, and sought after. But this also happens in labor markets. If you think about how markets for very specialized jobs work, so, um, you know, um, doesn't concern me yet, but, you know, tenured academics and top departments, um, you might think about this as being a very thin market. It's very difficult to divide up an academic, even though in principle you can have them work two jobs part time. But in general, these are these are very much um, um, uh, indivisible uh, things. And also, um, uh, kind of a, a way, perhaps uh, again, like labor markets from a design uh, um, angle, you might think also about just production. So very often, uh, production involves very specific inputs. Um, of some very specialized machines that are also indivisible. So there's plenty of settings. And of course, we'll come back to the auction setting and Elizabeth in particular, uh, tomorrow we'll talk about um, um, the, um, the, um, the um, auction setting um, um, uh, most of all, but keep them in mind. So what I'll do for the last little rest is that I'll assume that all goods except one are going to be indivisible. And this one good uh, X zero is going to be called money and we'll treat it as uh, the numeraire. And so the set of indivisible goods, pleasingly, is going to be called I. So I is going to be the set of indivisible goods. J is going to be the set of agents. Um, um, and just keep that in mind. And so XJ sub I um, is going to be the feasible bundles of indivisible goods. Okay. And so we'll come back to this. And so a feasible consumption bundle for an agent is going to be some amount of money and, um, and a vector that's going to tell us how many units of each indivisible good the agent is going to consume. Okay. So unless there's any questions at this point, maybe I'll pause. Um, I'll move straight into the setting of transferable utility economies. Super. Okay, great. So uh, transferable utility economies. So as I said, it turns out to be a fantastically tractable setting. Of course, transferable utility is something that's completely standard in mechanism design. Um, and in general equilibrium, of course, it feels like a much stronger assumption. So what is this, um, what are we assuming here? So we're going to assume that the utility function is going to take a very simple form. It's going to be a valuation over a bundle of indivisible goods plus some amount of money. Okay, so this VJ object is going to be the valuation, um, some real number. 
um, and we will simply add on the money. So the setting to think about is that indivisible goods actually don't comprise a large fraction of the agent's budget. And so in particular, the agent is able to freely borrow as much money as the agent wants in order to be able to procure the bundle that they like. Okay. So why is this a tractable setting? Well, it's because in order to find an efficient outcome, and efficiency is of course intimately related to competitive equilibrium, um, they're simply found by maximizing the sum of these uh, valuations. And we'll do this uh, very shortly. Um, and this makes the entire problem uh, much more uh, tractable. And in particular, in this setting also, endowments are not going to affect demand. So we can write down demand very simply as just being a function of uh, prices alone. So I don't even have to specify that the demand is Marshallian in this case. Um, I can just talk about demand um, um, and um, uh, denote it by dj um, of p. Okay. Great. So let's consider the simplest possible case that there is one indivisible good. Okay. So the problem could not have possibly been any uh, simpler. And in fact, let's make it even simpler and suppose that agents demanded most one unit. You might think that I'm actually almost patronizing this uh, distinguished audience, but actually um, this is not a bad case to uh, get immediately some insight about the difference between indivisible and divisible good markets. And if you are interested in what kind of good I'm thinking about here is perhaps a horse. Okay, so why am I using a horse? Well, um, it turns out that a, a famous economist from the 19, late 19th century, Ben Bavak, had a, um, a lovely description of a market for horses, where he wrote down valuations that buyers and sellers might possibly attach to a horse. Um, and here you can see that all the horses are valued uh, in pounds. And, and if you look at seller uh, B6, um, you can see that Bombavik was not very good with notations. So sellers are in fact denoted by letter B. But if you look at seller B6, then he values his horse at 21 pounds and 10 shilling. That's, that's the same thing as, as um, 21 and a half pounds, is there 20 shillings uh, to a pound um, at the time. Okay, so this is the, um, um, an example of the model that we have. Um, we assume that the horse why it might be a valuable commodity. It's not something that's going to break the bank for these, uh, for these uh, buyers and sellers. And so what you can do is you can actually plot the demand of the buyers and the, and the supply of the sellers. And indeed, this was done uh, in 1974, which again, I, I took the uh, figure straight out of a paper by Schotter. Um, and um, you can see um, where the two lines cross is in fact uh, the, uh, the, uh, where we would expect to have competitive equilibrium prices. And immediately the first thing that you might notice um, is that um, there are now an entire continuum of prices that are going to clear this market. So all prices between 21 um, and 22 and a half pounds um, are going to clear this market. And um, in fact, if you count up the number of steps, in, um, uh, in any uh, of these competitive equilibria, uh, five horses are going to be traded, right? So once you plot these uh, supply and demand curves, you can almost imagine that rather than having indivisible goods, instead we have a lot of agents that have exactly the same valuation. So that's one way of maybe getting some intuition for one of the results that you have is that you have a lot of agents that have a valuation of 28, and then you have a lot of agents that have a valuation of 26. And so it's therefore unsurprising that because there are a lot of agents with identical valuations from that perspective, that actually you get an entire continuum of market, uh, market uh, clearing prices. Okay. So that's already the difference between uh, a G, even in this uh, a very simple setting where, of course, um, we, we don't need to do a lot of maths. Now, this would not be a very good um, uh, kind of setting if this is where we would have to stop. But let me just take a, a one slide to set up a pretty important point, I think, um, that I'm going to come back to. It's that I've sort of did a bit of a sleight of hand here. I started out by talking about an exchange economy. And yet here now I'm talking about buyers and sellers, which of course is not something that you would have in an exchange economy. Typically, um, there is no such thing as just being a buyer or seller. But it turns out that in transferable utility economy, what you can do is you can move seamlessly between an exchange economy and a two-sided market. So the way to do it 
is to say, um, um, what we're going to have is that we're going to, have, uh, instead of our original uh, set of agents, some of whom are endowed with a horse and some of whom are not, we're going to define J to be the buyers who will have exactly the same function as before, but they will not own anything. And then I, and you can see here, I'm using the same letter as I would use for the goods, would be the sellers who will have a zero utility function. And I will use this uh, later on in one of my examples, and they will own the goods. So now I, I started with an exchange economy. I've now split everybody up. So I have my buyers and my sellers. And it turns out that in a transferable utility setting, um, and kind of, I'm giving you the formal citation for this, but I think this result is really known for a long time, is that a competitive equilibrium will exist in the exchange economy if and only if it will exist in this modified two-sided market. So in a way, I can move between competitive equilibrium and a two-sided market without any loss if what I'm interested in is the existence of competitive equilibrium. And so I will do that occasionally. I will just refer to agents as being buyers or sellers um, because um, it, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, uh, in this particular case, all right? So now let's enrich the model a bit. Um, it will make uh, things uh, 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 simpler and it will now talk a bit about buyers and sellers, as I said, without uh, any loss of generality. Um, so now let's say they're going to be multiple heterogeneous goods. You can think about maybe horses of different breeds, but perhaps houses uh, might be one example, uh, but there's still only one unit. There's going to be one unit of each good. Uh, and indeed um, uh, an agent is either going to be a seller and own an object or a demand one object, okay? Um, so all agents will have unit demand. Um, and um, this model is, um, is, yes, if, yes, yes. Um, is referred uh, to as an assignment market. Yes, Fujita. Um, yeah, so in the previous uh, uh, per, uh, diagram of uh, Baron Babel, it looks like you had uh, one type of good, but multiple units possibly. So here, are you restricting uh, the case in which uh, the entire economy just has just one unit of that uh, given good? So, so even in that model, what I um, so what was happening is that there were multiple units, but each unit was owned by an individual seller, right? So there was a seller that owned one horse, and there were buyers that wanted exactly one horse. Okay. So, um, so in principle, you're absolutely right. There were kind of multiple in general, but um, the the good is completely homogeneous, and so uh, this is how I set it up. And that's why I had this a side slide. Is that actually it doesn't matter whether I was talking about an exchange economy. And we had one person originally owning all the uh, all the horses, right? Um, or the the horses were actually split between different um, sellers. He had each seller owning a horse. Yeah, I see. And then uh, here in the I see now I understand the notation better. So here you are not saying that the entire economy has just one unit of good. It's just each J, uh, I guess, has uh, one unit. So here now I'm saying that the goods are going to be heterogeneous. In the Bambava case, the buyer doesn't care who they buy from because they value all the units exactly, all the horses. Um, um, so it, 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 they're, they're happy to get a horse from any of the sellers, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas here, you can now imagine that the horses are heterogeneous and different sellers own, uh, own different horses. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Okay, so this is another, called an uh, yeah. Alex, another uh, simple clarifying question. Yeah. Uh, is it allowed that uh, a seller has one orange and one apple? And is it allowed that uh, uh, a consumer can consume one uh, orange and one apple? So uh, no. So here I'm going to um, you 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 own at most one object. Yeah. So you you you're allowed to own one orange or one apple, and the but, agent. But, uh, yeah, this is a small point, but your, your definition of consumption set for J allows what I said. Correct. So this is why I'm adding. Oh, this is why I'm uh, uh, I'm so adding that extra line. I'm actually specifying. Okay. I'm restricting further. Okay. You're absolutely okay. right. Yeah. So this is the the, the third line specifies the second line. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, good. So um, so now this model, this very simple model, in which I um, um, the buyers um, are simply trying to get one uh, a good from one of the sellers, is called the assignment market. Um, and so let me denote by V I J. The surplus that's created when a uh, buyer and a seller interact uh, in a trade, okay? So here, this is meaningful because we're in a transferable utility setting. Um, and so if uh, a buyer buys a, a, buy a J buys a particular good I, his utility 
probability is going to be uh, here the value that he uh, places on a uh, good uh, good i minus the price that he pays, and that's going to be utility of uh, of uh, uh, this this buyer. Um, and if the seller uh, sells the good, then they of course get the price uh, minus the their their valuation uh, for their particular um, item. Okay, so this notation is just worth keeping in mind. You will need to keep it in mind for exactly this slide and the next one. Um, and so the first question we might ask is, what is the efficient assignment in this assignment market, right? How do we maximize the, um, the um, um, how do we find an efficient outcome? And that's, of course, in a transfer of utility setting, the same as saying, how do we um, find the, um, the sum of the uh, valuations that is going to uh, be as large as possible, given the constraint that you can only uh, engage in a trade with at most one other person on the other side. So let me denote by alpha ij the, um, the fractional assignment of good i to agent j. So here I'm allowing, as it were, a fraction of the good to be assigned in principle. And so what is the efficient assignment uh, problem well, what I want to do is I want to maximize these sums of valuations that are going to be uh, the, the surpluses, right, um, from all the trades, subject to the following constraints, that every, um, every good is, um, is exactly assigned and um, every agent um, is, if you like, exactly assigned. We don't want any fraction of uh, a good assigned or any agent as being a fraction assigned. Um, um, so, um, so each... A each good is given to exactly one agent, each agent is given exactly one good, um, and uh, um, that this fraction be greater uh, than zero. So this is a linear program. Now, this will not be very satisfying if the solution to this linear program were in fact a fractional assignment where, you know, I would be trading you know, half a horse with Michi, that would not be good. But of course, it turns out that this problem always has an integral solution. And so what is the reason for that? Well, the reason is that the, we are trying to maximize a linear function over a polyhedron. And so why is it a, a polyhedron? That's much less obvious. And the reason for that comes from the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem. But this uh, this our constraint set as a polyhedron. If you if you maximize a linear function of a polyhedron, you will um, either make sure that you hit one of the vertices. It's going to be an integral vertex. It turns out, um, and um, this integral vertex by the uh, Birkhoff von Neumann theorem is going to be um, always um, 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 a solution. Now, sometimes you might have a continuum of solutions because you might sort of hit uh, one of the one of the faces of this um, of this polyhedron, um, but it, but still you are also then going to be maybe hitting uh, several integral points. So um, there will always be one integral solution um, at least to this. And this this kind of beautiful and important result was first shown by Koopmans and Beckman all the way back in 1957. And in the third lecture, I will come back to this model again and show you. Um, how we can uh, use it uh, uh, for, uh, for thinking about markets with income effects too. So um, now let's take this primal uh, uh, problem and think about naturally in linear programming, you often think about the dual, right? So recall that um, USI was the profit or the utility of a seller and UBJ was the, uh, uh, um, was the profit or the utility uh, of the buyer. And so what we can do, um, as you do in linear programming, when we, we start with the primal, we'll go to the dual, we swap the constraints um, and the variables. And so here now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now minimize the, the utilities of the sellers, subject to the constraints that the sum of the profits is at least the surplus that's created for every buyer and for every seller. And so why is this a useful formulation? Why is looking at this dual turns out to be so useful? Well, first of all, strong duality tells us that the value of the maximization pro uh, problem from the previous slide is going to be equal to the value of the minimization problem that I have specified over here. That's, that's um, um, uh, the, the first point. And, um, and so this is going to be very useful to us. But the second point is that the dual actually tells us what the prices are. Once we solve the dual, we can immediately write down the prices because we know that prices are given uh, 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 by the sum 
um, um, of the value of, let's say, of the seller um, and, um, um, and the utility of the profit. I've simply taken the utility equation for the seller and, and swapped the two numbers around. So immediately from the solution, we can back out what the prices are going to be. And this means that now we have an efficient assignment and we have prices, which means that we have prices that support the efficient allocation. And so that tells us immediately that competitive equilibrium will in fact exist in this assignment market. This is the result due to Koopmans and Beckman. Um, and the intuition for the proof is the one that you have already seen. Primal gives us the allocation, the dual gives us the prices. And so this wonderful duality turns out to, uh, to fully uh, capture what we need to know in this market. Now, there was um, another thing that you might have noticed um, is that the dual also seems to incorporate some of the constraints that look like constraints for blocking sets. And it actually turns out that um, the dual really specifies everything you need to know about the core of this, um, 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 of, for this problem. So as I said before, the core is going to be an, a, an allocation that cannot be improved by a set of agents that will be reallocating uh, objects among themselves. And it turns out that in a setting with indivisible goods, and in particular in this assignment market, and this is what Chaplin should have proved, is that competitive equilibrium outcomes um, are going to coincide with the core. They're not going to be uh, uh, smaller than the core as in the general equilibrium setting. So how do you get this result? How do you capture the core? Well, all you need to do actually um, is just to stare at the dual uh, uh, for, uh, for um, a moment. And actually what you see is that the constraints in the dual tell you everything you know about the feasibility and the objective itself is essentially the condition that you need for non-improvability. So you need the feasibility and the improvability to make sure that you have your core. And in fact, everything, you know, these conditions are almost exactly the same conditions as you have in the dual problem. And so what Chaplin Schublich pointed out, they said, look, um, um, uh, this is how you solve for the core imputation. You simply just, um, you simply just solve uh, the dual. Now, the last thing I want to tell you about, and this is going to be a structural result, um, is going uh, is 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 also um, you know something you don't get in general equilibrium. It's kind of structure of competitive equilibrium prices. Now, what Chaplin Schubik showed is that there in fact exists a minimum price and a maximum price competitive equilibrium price vector. Right. So we can sort of order. They can, what, what they said is there is going to be a price vector where which all the buyers really like and all the sellers really dislike, and there's going to be a price vector that all the sellers really like and all the uh, uh, buyers really dislike. And they said these two price vectors are going to be as far away from each other as, as, as it is possible. So what is the intuition for this proof? I'm not going to give you the full proof, but there's very nice intuition for this. Remember what happened in the, uh, in the example with the horses. There was a continuum of equilibrium prices. And so what you can really do is you can take, the, you, can, you can look at all the agents who are making some profit and subtract a small constant from all the prices without upsetting the equilibrium. And what you can do is you can push people down slowly to their reservation utility. At some point, somebody is going to have to change their allocation because the prices have changed too much. But you can keep pushing them down for some time until, um, um, until somebody wants to, uh, to switch their allocation. And essentially, um, that's the intuition for what's going on here to get the minimum price. And you can do the same thing with the maximum price. You can keep raising prices for quite a while because the goods are indivisible um, without upsetting the efficient allocation. Um, and, um, um, and therefore get the maximum uh, equilibrium price um, vector. Okay, so hopefully already you can see that there's a big difference between indivisible good markets and, uh, and our typical general equilibrium setting. Okay. Uh, 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 Alex, can I? Uh, yeah. yeah. So in this intuition of yours, so um, that seems to give me the intuition that uh, you can get uh, some kind of uh, maximal prices. Um, but uh, it seems that the statement says actually there's a, a, high, a maximum price which is highest for everyone, every good, uh, and likewise for the uh, 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 mark, uh, minimum prices. And uh, it, it, is the intention going through for that statement? Or? 
Yeah. So, I mean, you can, of course, as you know, you can say actually much more, right? You can actually, and I will come back to this. You can even say um, that um, that uh, prices are going, the equilibrium prices are going to form a lattice. And so that's, uh, that's uh, kind of really uh, capturing the point that I think you've made. I think the, int uh, I, the intuition for that, I think, at least for me, is a bit less obvious, right? Especially in a general setting, exactly why that's the case. I think this is the, this is the most I can give you in two lines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank but, you. Yeah, so, I was asking because precisely because this was a, such a sort of a mysterious and wonderful result. So <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid not. So of course, this intuition is in Shapley and Schubert, and so right. I think this is good intuition. But you're right, and they themselves say that it's not entirely complete, and so you do you do need to unfortunately go. Uh, through the whole proof. Um, right. Great. Thank um, thanks for the question, Hitai. So um, now let's come back to the point I think that uh, Michi made a few slides ago, which was what happens when somebody wants an apple and orange together. And so let's think about a setting in which there is in fact multi-good demand. Um, and so here is a very simple example um, to think about. Now, suppose there are two goods in total and there's a seller that owns both goods and values them at nothing, remember, as per our construction. And there are two buyers, blue buyer J and a uh, red buyer K, uh, who have the following valuations. Okay, and the valuations look like this. So uh, buyer uh, uh, J um, regard, uh, views um, um, each good, uh, uh, values each good at one, but the bundle of the goods at three. So he really wants to get both goods together. Whereas um, a buyer K values both goods at two, um, so either good at two, but the bundle of the goods at three. So he's not, he doesn't, you know, the, getting the second good um, doesn't really add that much to his utility. So what you can do, um, and this will be very useful for uh, tomorrow's lecture given by Elizabeth, um, uh, is you can plot this graphically in price space. Okay, so let me show you how the, um, and let's just, I'm just going to show you the valuations one more time. So I'm now first going to deal with a blue buyer J, okay? So this is the one that really wants to get both goods, okay? So what do his demands actually look like? Well, if we look at price space, I've got price of good one on the x-axis, price of good two on the, on the y-axis. Now, what you can do is you can divide up the entire price space into um, uh, where different bundles of the goods are demanded. So if the prices are very high in the northeast corner, the agent is going to demand nothing. And if the prices are very low in the bottom right corner, the agent is going to demand both bundles, okay? And so what's interesting is exactly what happens sort of in the middle. Now, if the price of, of, um, of good, uh, good one is very high and the price of good two is very low, we're in the bottom right case in that case, then the agent will demand the second good, good two, and vice versa, if the price of good one is very low and the price of good two is very high, the agent is going to demand the other good, okay? And there's going to be some prices at which the agent is indifferent between um, getting no goods and both goods, okay? And this is why um, there's going to be this line going from the top left to the bottom right, okay? This diagonal line going from the top left to the bottom right. Now, so I can do the same thing for the other agent. I'll just quickly recall what, remember their valuations are going to be uh, two for either good and three for both goods together, they're actually going to look like this, right? So again, the same story as before. Price is very high, you demand nothing. Price is very low, you demand uh, both goods. But now there are going to be prices where the agent is going to switch between demanding one good and then switch immediately to demanding the other good. So in the previous case, we had an agent switching from demanding both goods to demanding nothing. Um, this was this diagonal line that, that goes from the top left to the bottom right. Now here, we, uh, we have an agent switching from um, demanding one good to demanding the other good. The agent doesn't actually switch from demanding nothing to demanding everything, okay? Now, what we can do is we can put these two lines together and think about aggregate demand, okay? So now I've just kind of composed everything together. And if you stare at this picture for a bit, what you can convince yourselves of is that in fact, there is no competitive equilibrium in this market at all, okay? Um, and the reason is that no matter where you try to uh, uh, put a price vector, what you're going to find is that one good is going to be either demanded or over-demanded. 
And this very interesting intersection of these two lines, and Elizabeth tomorrow is going to call them the locus of indifference prices, this strange intersection of these two lines turns out to have a very um, um, important geometric interpretation. And, and Elizabeth will explain exactly how the geometry of this, um, of, of this picture actually tells you that equilibrium is not going to exist. And so this is a very simple example, perhaps you know, maybe the simplest example you can really come up with um, where um, this, um, this, uh, th this holds, but it turns out that this strange intersection of these two diagonal lines um, happens to be a general way in which equilibrium um, is going to fail. And, um, and I think the best contrast to it is going to be see when equilibrium succeeds. So I will, I will show you that uh, in a few slides time, okay? And so the question we might ask is, okay, well, can we use this nice linear programming approach to say something about existence of, um, of um, uh, um, equilibrium in the case where agents demand uh, multiple, uh, multiple goods? And the answer is yes, it's not going to be as useful because of course now we know we don't have existence, um, but we can say, still say uh, quite a bit. Now, this is going to look like a very intimidating integer program, but what it, what, um, the reason why I'm putting it up here is hopefully it doesn't look too different from the linear program we had seen before for the assignment market. What it's now doing is it's now assigning an alpha weight. Remember those alpha weights was the fractional assignment of good, I, uh, of good I to agent J before. Now it's a fractional assignment of an entire vector of goods. Okay, so we're gonna have these alpha Js for each vector. But apart from that, the, um, the, um, the, um, the problem is actually going to be essentially um, the same one. So here now, um, 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 I'm setting up the maximum and just trying to maximize the uh, sum of the valuations um, under this uh, possibly fraction, um, um, uh, you know, um, um, uh, under this, I'm going to say integer assignment at this point. Now I want to make sure that the goods are allocated as a whole. It's now going to be an integer problem. Um, and again, um, um, subject to the usual constraints. One of them um, is, of course, going to be um, that um, um, we um, want to ensure market clearing and that the, um, that the, the goods are assigned in their totality. Um, now, this is an integer problem. In general, it might be very hard to solve and it doesn't, uh, you know, really, um, it might not, you know, kind of tell us very much. But in fact, what we can do, and this is um, how one often approaches integer uh, programs, is that you can relax it in the same way as we had relaxed it with the assignment market. So this is really, if you can solve this problem and get your alphas to be, um, uh, to be uh, uh, integers, you will have a, a competitive equilibrium. Now, what you can also do is you can relax it to a linear program. So now here, what I've now allowed is my alphas, my, fraction, my assignment to be fractional. Okay. Um, now, if this problem has an integer solution, then you will have a um, um, you will have a, um, a competitive equilibrium. And in fact, there is an even nicer way, I think, of really seeing the relation between these two problems and existence of equilibrium. And this is a, this is only a lemma in this beautiful paper, but I think this lemma is is really rather nice. Um, it says the following, competitive equilibrium will exist. And this is now in a very general setting. You can have multiple goods, multiple units of each goods. There's really no restriction at all. We're in a completely general setting. If and only if the values of the optimal solution to the integer problem and to the, to the uh, linear, uh, uh, linear program relaxation are going to coincide. So why is this kind of nice? Is because you can take an example like the one we had previously, this one, you can solve for the value of the integer program and you can solve for the value of the linear program and check whether these values coincide or not. And it turns out the answer is not in this case. So why is this not true? Well, if you look at the integer program here, if you solve it, the value you're going to get is three because you should be assigning the good to say the um, Asian J. But if you solve the linear program relaxation, you're going to assign half of the bundle one one to agent J and half of um, bundle one zero and half of bundle zero one to agent K. Now that's going to give you, and you sum them up together, that's going to be feasible. That's going to give you a value of three and a half. Now that means that the value of the linear program relaxation and the, uh, the integer program do not coincide. 
And so therefore equilibrium will not exist for this particular example. And of course, we have already seen the, um, the graphical intuition for this. So I think this is a lovely, beautiful theorem by Vic Chandani and Mama. Um, that is a kind of a quick fire way of checking it. Now, of course, it's true that in principle, you do need <laughs> to check this, you do need to solve an integer program and integer program, it can be computationally very hard, but for very simple examples, you can very often just look at it and solve it just by inspection and then um, and very quickly determine whether or not equilibrium exists. So um, something that turns out to be quite useful um, uh, when you work on these problems. So now let me then also give you a very general result for the core. So I've said nothing about the core in the, in the very general setting with multiple goods and, and you know, uh, uh, agents demanding multiple goods. Now here, let me be a little bit, uh, a little bit more formal. I want to think about, you know, what the core is going to be. So think about a general game in characteristic form. I've got a set of agents and the value function that is going to assign a, uh, a value to each coalition. And one of the results that we already know is this stunning result by Bondarova and Shapley, which gives us a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of the core, okay? For the non-emptiness of the core. So, um, so uh, what is this uh, condition? So it might look a little bit sort of abstract written like this, they called it balance, or it's called balancedness. And so what does this condition really say? It says the following thing. Suppose that we could assign a function which told us what fraction of the time each agent spends in each coalition. This, this function is called gamma, okay? Now it better be the case because each agent is spending some time in each coalition that the sum of the, um, of the time spent in each coalition sums up to one. That's the first equality on the left. Balancedness says that it better be the case that the value generated, the weighted value, the, the, the value weighted by time spent in each coalition must be less or equal to um, the value that's generated by the, uh, by the, um, the, grand, the grand coalition. That N should really be a J, okay? So this is everybody um, um, in one coalition, okay? So it's a, so no matter how you assign the time spent in the coalitions, the value that's generated by the agents by spending this time cannot be more than the value that's generated together. And this turns out to be a necessary and sufficient condition in a very general uh, game. So one would hope that you can just take this result and just apply it to our setting. After all, we have agents who are exchanging goods, they're generating value, so we should be able to rewrite the game uh, in this characteristic form and assign this value function. But actually it turns out that this condition does not work. If what you do is you start with an exchange economy and you create this coalitional form by considering coalitions of agents. If you try to apply balancedness to, uh, 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 to this game that you've created, you're actually not going to uh, uh, get the core of this economy. And so what are we going to do? Well, we can now use one of the results that we had already seen, which is that the exchange economy can be transformed into a two-sided market. So what we are going to do is where we're going to transform it to a two-sided market and then uh, think about coalitions that arise in this two-sided market. And the beautiful result by Ma says that a competitive equilibrium will exist in the original economy if and only if the coalitional form game in the two-sided market that corresponds to this exchange economy is going to be balanced. Peter, I think you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, um, so let me make sure I followed what you are saying. So uh, uh, if I understand correctly, bondoleva Shapley's characterization uh, kind of works um, for arbitrary games or, yeah. or uh, TU games with uh, uh, in characteristic function form. So yeah. uh, are you saying that the in order to obtain the equivalence between the competitive equilibrium and the core, you need to define the core uh, in the market, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the transformed uh, two-sided market rather than the- Correct, in, so, yeah, exactly. So you can't just take the exchange economy as it is and just apply the, you know, and just think about coalitions of agents. That's the issue because that's not going to give you the core that you had originally, right? But what you can do is you can do the transformation, then apply the, um, this result, 
um, and then uh, and it, then it turns out to work. So in fact, you know, the result that you know you you you, you know it should work in principle, right? Because you have the right but it's not clear exactly what is going to be the connection to competitive equilibrium right, right. and so and so to to actually link the two you do need to do that transformation and that's part of the reason why i showed you that transformation in the first place is that actually for this particular result it turns out to be crucial to do this transformation otherwise it doesn't work but then now hopefully everything is tied together we now have a very kind of coherent theory. We know exactly we have a necessary and sufficient condition for existence of equilibrium and we also have a corresponding necessary and sufficient condition from a perspective of cooperative game theory, which is, I, I, I think, also uh, a very important. But Alex, uh, one question about the example. Uh, yeah. Is, uh, does core exist in, in, in the example? Or can you apply Shapre von Daleva to show that there, there is, the core is empty? Um, I, have a, I don't think, I, I think the core is empty in there, in there as well. <laughs> Sorry, so you said core. Is I, I, I haven't checked it. Yeah, so I checked. think in this example, yeah, I haven't checked it, but in this example, yeah. So Maya gives an example of exactly uh, this uh, this issue where you have balancedness, but you, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me make sure I, I follow your conversation. So if I understand correctly, uh, uh, you have uh, presented an uh, example in which the uh, competitive equilibrium indeed uh, fails to exist. So if we believe this mass results, then we should, uh, it should be that the- It's, the, it's, it's correct. I haven't actually checked where the balance this condition, but it, it better be the case, right? Because you have a coincidence between competitive equilibrium and the core. And so, um, yeah, we would hope so, right? And again, remember I presented as a two-sided market, there is no transformation to do anymore, right? Okay, got it, thank you. But the trouble with both of these conditions, right, this kind of IP, LP uh, result and this balancedness result, these conditions are hard to check. They're not kind of economically easily interpretable. There isn't an obvious uh, kind of straightforward economic interpretation of these conditions. So what we really want is an interpretable condition on preferences for equilibrium existence. And I think the most important such condition is called uh, substitutability, and this is a definition that's due to Kelsen and Crawford, and, and really this formal one is really due to Orzabal and Milgram, but I think Kelsen and Crawford really deserve the credit, entire, really, entirety of this credit for this insight. So we're going to say that agents have a substitute valuation if we start with some price vector and we look at um, um, where demand is single valued, right? So you demand exactly one bundle. And now we're going to increase the price of one good I, okay? And we're going to move to another region where demand is going to be single valued, where the, the agent now demands bundle X prime. Now, what we would demand to be the case, that it better be the case that for all goods K that are not I, demand for them weekly increases after demand for good I has gone up, okay? So in other words, Goods are substitutes if increasing the price of one good weekly increases demand for all the other goods. Okay. Now, what Kelso and Crawford showed is that if all agents have substitutes valuations, then competitive equilibria exist. Now, this is a much more interpretable condition. Now, many people on this call that I have seen join have studied this structure and looked at this problem in many different settings. This condition comes up in matching, it comes up in so many places. But nevertheless, let me quickly explain, at least briefly, how the proof of this result works. So the first thing we want to do, of course, now remember, we want to discretize prices a little bit so that demand is actually single valued. It's kind of a very, very small thing. It turns out you don't even need to do it, but things are going to be much easier to explain. Okay, so suppose that wherever I end up, I'm going to have single valued demand, okay? So now what I want to do is I want to start at very low prices. Now I can make the prices very, very, very low, and ensure that um, that um, um, that um, the um, uh, firms are interested in buying um, um, goods, right? So that nobody is kind of priced out of anything. Now, if one, if more than one firm demands a good, I'm just going to increase its price. Now, what happens is because of substitutability, as I increase the prices, the demands for other goods are going to weekly increase. And so, what I'm then going to do is to increase the prices of those goods, and what happens is, of course, eventually I have to price people out because 
Valuations are finite. I keep increasing the prices. Eventually, I'm going to be able to clear the market for each good. And so that's, the, that's going to give me uh, this kind of discretized competitive equilibrium. Then I can take a limit and then obtain the equilibrium in the economy with continuous prices. Now, you don't even need to do this. You can really do this directly just by um, um, without discretization, uh, but it's a little bit fiddly. So why does it work? Well, recall the agent that we had in our previous example who valued the goods at two and valued the bundle at three. This agent actually has substitutes valuations. That was the red agent, okay? So um, it, hopefully it's kind of natural why he regards goods as substitutes because the bundle of the goods together give him less value than the sum of the valuations of the individual bundle. Now, this is not a general condition. I should stress very carefully, it's not a general condition. You can't use this kind of subadditivity argument in general, um, but for a too good case uh, here, um, it turns out to be fine. So now, now what I can do is I can um, uh, recall, this is uh, the, the, his preferences could be represented by this, uh, by these uh, red lines. Now what I can do is I can add another agent who also has preferences that look a little bit like this. They're preferences of another agent with um, the substitutes valuations, and this is the agent in purple. And I can just put them together in one picture. Now here, if you stare at this picture for a moment, you will find there, in fact, there are market clearing prices now. And where are they located? Well, they're sort of right in the middle. There is this, um, there is this shape which has, which um, this kind of hexagon, um, in, in which one agent demands uh, um, uh, the second good and the other agent demands the first good. And in fact, that way the market for both good clears. Um, and so the, um, the prices that support this equilibrium look a bit like this. And as per Fujito's previous question, um, we're coming back to now looking at this uh, set of prices and now they have a lovely structure. And in fact, uh, these competitive equilibrium prices form a lattice. So you take two price vectors, take the min of them, that's still going to be a competitive equilibrium price vector. And in particular, there is the smallest and the largest uh, um, uh, competitive equilibrium price vector, which are basically the extreme points um, um, of this lattice. So the buyers really want to be at the bottom. Uh, uh, um, um, our buyers really want to be on the bottom left corner of this um, um, of this lattice. So when I was describing this this kind of intuition for how this proof works. You might have noticed the similarity. This kind of it sounded a bit like a monotonic auction, right? I have prices that I'm increasing due to over demand, but you might have also reinterpreted it if you work on matching or if you've seen this kind of thing before as a bit like the deferred acceptance algorithm, where the um, the agents, if you like, are proposing to the goods, um, and um, and the goods say no um, uh, to some agents and uh, reject the agents, and the prices of the goods thereby increase. So there's a kind of an uh, an interpretation of this monotonic auction as the deferred acceptance algorithm. It turns out the connection is extremely tight. Um, these things really are truly related. And so if I were giving a lecture on matching, I could have given you a lot of very similar results um, uh, um, without ever mentioning the word price for a moment. Okay. Now, as I showed you in the previous picture, equilibrium prices uh, form a lattice. Um, and in fact, these ascending and descending auctions can be used to find either the lowest or the highest equilibrium price. And then you might say, okay, so is there a connection of the lowest equilibrium prices perhaps to, to implementation? And it turns out that if you replicate the economy enough, you can generate enough competition such that the lowest equilibrium prices in fact coincide with Vickery Club Grove's payment. So in a kind of competitive indivisible good economy, you can have um, um, you can have kind of a strategy proof implementation of this, um, of these, um, um, using these lowest equilibrium prices. But I think the result that I really want to stress here is that in a certain sense, and I really here want to stress in a very particular sense, um, especially given Elizabeth's lecture tomorrow, and actually really the rest of our lectures, substitutability um, is sort of necessary, as it were, for existence of equilibrium. Now here, let me be a bit more precise. What I mean is that they form a maximal domain of preferences. What do I mean by that is the following. Suppose you had uh, um, um, at least two agents and some agent, uh, uh, agent J demands at most one unit of each good and his valuation is not a substitutes valuation. What one will be able to do is to construct substitutes valuations for all the other agents such that no competitive equilibrium exists. 
Okay, so if you start with one agent who looked a bit like our complementary agent, remember the agent that valued each good at one and the bundle of the goods at three, I would be able to then create another agent with, um, with a, uh, a substitute valuation to destroy competitive equilibrium. And in a way, the way to do it is one way you can kind of think about doing this graphically, so you can draw the picture and then create that strange intersection of these two lines, uh, of these two uh, 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 loci of indifference prices, such that equilibrium fails. So this is a very powerful result. It all, almost tells you that you can't step outside of substitutability, but it turns out that this maximal domain result is, you know, um, while it's very powerful, it also doesn't tell you the full story. In fact, you can do much more interesting things than just substitutability. Um, and I want to mention um, uh, some of them uh, in a moment. Now, why is all this stuff really useful? Well, in particular, it's extremely useful if what you're interested in is auction design. And here, what I want to do is to very briefly describe, and Elizabeth will give much more detail tomorrow, is to describe an auction that Paul Klemperer had originally proposed for the Bank of England uh, um, during the, uh, the financial crisis. So here now we are gonna think about two heterogeneous goods being strong and weak collateral that the banks can put up uh, uh, in, uh, in order to get bank loans. And they have preferences about what kind of collateral they're going to put up. So we have a price for strong collateral and a price for weak collateral. So you have a boring auction where you either have to bid on strong or on weak collateral. You might sort of expect a bid like this. So here a particular a bank wants to borrow 100 million yen. I realize that's a very small amount for a bank. Um, um, and it's got a kind of has this maximum price that it's prepared to pay. Or alternatively, it could, uh, it could only put up weak collateral. But what's lovely about this auction, it allows you to create bids of the following manner. It can say, I could place a bid somewhere in the middle of this price space. And then this would be a bid that is either for weak or for strong collateral depending on which one has a better price. So what do I mean by whichever one has a better price? Well, again, let's carve up the space. If the price of the weak collateral um, is, um, is going to be very low and the price of strong collateral is going to be very high, what the bank will want to do is to put up weak collateral. That's at the top left of the picture. If the price is a uh, weak collateral is very low and the price of strong collateral is very high, then the bank would want to put up strong collateral. But if we have the top right and the prices are just too high, now here prices, of course, are just interest rates, right? If the prices are too high, um, the bank doesn't actually want to borrow at all, okay? So why is this useful? Well, you can, um, um, you can very quickly have a bunch of bids that are all going to be located in this price space. It's very easy for banks to actually submit these bids. These are called dot bids. They're basically defined by these dots. So you can imagine another bank coming in and saying, I would like to borrow 200 million yen. Okay, again, I know it's a very small amount, okay? Now, how does their, uh, how do their uh, preference are going to look? They're gonna be very similar, but now you can very quickly write down what the aggregate demand is. So without, Kind of belaboring this too much, if you look at the top left corner, what's happening is that uh, both banks are interested in, um, in uh, putting up weak collateral, right? So the red bank is interested in a hundred million, uh, they the, um, in a hundred million loan. Um, the, um, the purple bank is interested in a 200 million loan. Both of them would prefer to have the, the weak collateral. But in in, um, in the middle where the prices are kind of in between, one bank actually wants strong collateral, the other bank wants weak collateral. And so once you can, you have a, this straightforward language because banks find um, weak and strong collateral as essentially being perfect substitutes. You have this very clean language to be able to aggregate um, uh, uh, preferences calculate the aggregate demand and then match it to the supply of, um, of uh, loans that the central bank is actually willing to give. And so this is actually the structure, roughly the structure um, of the, um, the auction that the Bank of England still runs. And I'm very glad that Paul is on the line. So should you have any questions about this, um, I have the perfect person to answer it. And of course, Elizabeth has contributed hugely to the development of this auction as well. And she will mention um, it uh, tomorrow. So, um, so far I've been sort of 
uh, trying to avoid uh, a little bit the issue of having multiple units of goods. I've really tried to keep it to one unit of, um, of, uh, of each good, um, as you remember. Um, but actually, it turns out that multiple units also create themselves a, uh, a bit of a problem. So in particular, there's multiple units of goods and substitute valuations turn out to be insufficient for existence. So everything I've told you so far has really kept that assumption of a single unit of each good. Now, can we rescue what's going on? I mean, first, let me give intuition for why that's true. And the intuition is that if you have multiple units, what can happen is that I can substitute from one unit of a good immediately to two units of another good, right? So remember, there'll be some prices at which I would like to substitute from one good to another. But if there are multiple units of the other good, and I'm switching from one unit of one to two units of the other, the two units of that good are actually complementary to one another. And as you've seen before, complementarity can create problems for existence, right? Especially complementarity that runs into substitutability. So that definitely creates problems. Now, what you can do is you can still run a ascending auction and it will still terminate, but it's going to terminate at something that might not be an exact equilibrium. It's what's called a pseudo equilibrium. So it's an equilibrium in a convexified economy. You sort of pretend that the goods are actually divisible. So how can we ensure that the pseudo equilibrium actually is a competitive equilibrium? You actually need just a slightly stronger condition. What you need is that goods be substitutes when each unit of a good is treated as a separate good. So you imagine that these multiple units are in fact separate goods and you then apply your substitutability condition on that. Now, if um, goods are in fact strong substitutes, then um, you will have equilibrium. And in fact, in the product mix auction that I have described for the Bank of England, um, the, um, the, the valuations that are submitted, in fact, they are strong substitutes, okay? So this is a kind of a smaller side of multiple units and Elizabeth, I think we'll cover some of that uh, tomorrow. <coughs> So let me, let me um, briefly tell you kind of why substitutes are not the end of the story. Now, so here's one lovely example of um, um, when you can go beyond substitutes. So suppose I could partition the goods into two sets, okay? Set S1, which can be say um, something like tables and set S2, which can be something like chairs. Now, what I'm going to impose is that agents regard goods in the set S1 as substitutes, goods in set S2 as substitutes, but any item from S1 and any item from S2 as complements. So all tables are substitutes, all chairs are substitutes, but a table and a chair together are obviously complements. Same with trousers and shirts or left shoes and right shoes. Okay. That turns out that if agents have such preferences then competitive equilibrium always exists. Here you seem to have a mix of substitutes and complements. And I'll show you in a moment why that turns out to be the case. It turns out you can substantially generalize this result, right? Is that actually, and I will show you why, in a way, this kind of formulation um, doesn't really even go beyond substitutes. But it turns out you can substantially generalize this to cases where you truly do have complements and substitutes. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, these results uh, were uh, um, um, kind of really beautifully elucidated by Paul and Elizabeth's work, and that will be uh, tomorrow. So how does this, um, how does the intuition for approving this particular result work, where you have these two uh, um, uh, sets um, of uh, goods which are complements between one another? What you can do is rather than starting prices very low, what you do is you start prices very low for one set of the goods, and very high for the other set of the goods. And then you run the, um, the, the Tautonomon process. So let me give you kind of geometric intuition for this. Suppose we, um, our, we actually only have one table and one chair, okay? So we have one table and one chair. Um, and so they're going to be complements between themselves. And, um, and of course there is only one uh, table in set S1 and one chair in set S2. So in fact, this corresponds quite nicely to our previous example where the agent, um, um, our blue agent viewed goods as complements. Now, if I added an other agent on top of this, what you can see is that in fact, now you still have um, uh, market clearing. So we will assign both goods to the agent that values them more. And we will assign nothing to the agent uh, that values them less. Okay, that's going to be the efficient assignment. And these are going to be the prices that support the efficient assignment. These are competitive equilibrium prices. Now, 
this shape does not look like the lattice we had before, right? Because if I take two prices and I take them in, I can step outside of this lattice. But it actually still is a lattice. The only thing is that the ordering is slightly different, right? So now here, I'm almost imagining that, you know, if I imagine that the prices of good one were actually all negative numbers rather than positive numbers, I could flip this lattice around and it will look exactly like the lattice we have for the substitute goods. So in fact, you still get the lattice structure. It's just the partial order is going to be slightly differently defined. And the intuition for how the tautonomon works is rather than starting in the bottom left corner and moving up into the competitive um, equilibrium, what we want to do is to start either at the top left corner or start at the top right corner. And what we will do is that we will reach um, one of the edges um, 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 of this lattice. So in a sense, we recover the same result that we had before, but seemingly here now we actually have complements. So this idea of flipping the axes is going to come up tomorrow, I hope in Elizabeth's lecture, where she will show that in fact, um, you can think about this, uh, this example as a basis change of our previous substitutes example. And so in a, in a certain sense, it's not really uh, formally even uh, um, um, that much, much more general, but it does show you that you really can have uh, complements here. And so the last example I want to give you. Oh, sorry, yes, Reid. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so about this Sunan Yang thing. So I, yeah. uh, I wonder if you are seeing the following. And I, I, I always thought of their result as kind of saying that uh, you can define one, one type of goods uh, as sort of like a negative of, like let's say the good means actually the negative of a chair or something. What exactly. Yeah. yeah. So is yeah. it the right intuition or should I, I? I think that's exactly the intuition that I have, right? You basically flip the uh, flip how you think about buy. You can rather than thinking about buying, think of it as selling, for example. That's one way to think about it, right? Um, or think about rather than the price being positive, you have the price being negative. So you just sort of flip, right? So that's exactly the right way to think about this. Now, you can see how here now what you're doing is by doing this flipping, you are then really just recovering substitutes. And so this is the basis change point. Now, it turns out you can go far beyond that. You can actually create classes uh, um, of valuations which exhibit complements, and yet you can't do this basis change back to substitutes. And that's what Elizabeth will cover tomorrow. Um, in fact, you can have uh, uh, complements that truly are complements, okay? Where, where, and also you can't run the Tottenham argument and you're not going to get the lattice either. Uh, okay, got it, thank you. Great. So uh, one more example, and then I'll move on to income effects. Um, I'm running only slightly behind, I think. So <clears throat> um, here's one more example where you can get um, equilibrium. And I think it's also a beautiful representation um, uh, of preferences for which you get um, uh, existence. So suppose we could represent valuations over goods as a value graph. Now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> suppose we had three goods, and each good is a node in this graph. And so for this particular agent, good one is valued at five yen, good two is valued at 20 yen, and good three is valued at 50 yen. And what I'm allowed to do is to create pairwise substitutabilities and complementarities for these goods. So I'm allowed to add an edge between any two goods, uh, which has a particular weight. So for this agent, there's an edge of minus seven between good one and, uh, and good two. And so it means that um, um, these two goods are pairwise substitutes. Okay, uh, while good one and good three, I'm going to add an edge which is plus 20 yen, which means that these two goods are actually going to be pairwise complements. Now, what I mean is that the valuation of good one is still five yen, a valuation of good three is still 50 yen, but the valuation of good one and good three together is going to be five yen plus 50 yen plus the 20 yen edge. Now, more generally, you can say, look at any induced subgraph by the nodes of the goods that you're interested in, this will and just add up the nodes and the edges in this um, in this induced subgraph. This will tell you what the valuation of this bundle is. Okay, so that's what's called a graphical valuation. Now, what you need to now do is to make the following assumption. Suppose that this graph is in fact a tree, meaning that it has no cycles of the kind I described, and moreover, assume that whenever I have a negative edge a red edge, Fujita also has a red edge. Whenever I have a green edge, 
Fujita also has a green edge. That is, whenever I regard goods as pairwise substitutes, so does Fujita. Whenever I regard goods as pairwise complements, so does Fujita. So does everybody else. Now, I think the second condition is quite intuitive. We either regard goods as complements or as substitutes. The condition about the graph not having cycles might be a little bit odder, but you can often come up with examples in spectrum where actually this is not too unnatural. So for example, you can order goods in a way that they only interact um, with nearby goods. So in whenever you have kind of geography, this sometimes might make sense, um, where goods kind of only interact uh, uh, locally with one another. So if you had a valuation structure that looked like this, and here I note you have both substitutes and complements in a very serious way, it turns out that competitive equilibria exists. And in fact, there are fast algorithms to find uh, these, uh, these algorithms as well. And I think it is a really wonderful, beautiful paper in operations research by Olsen Jandagan, Asos Dekla, and Pablo Parilla. Okay. So that's all I have to say about the transferable utility case. I hope I've convinced you that First of all, your intuitions, perhaps that you got very early on about the coincidence of the core and competitive equilibrium turns out to be really quite general. And you really can link competitive equilibrium to cooperative game theory in a very meaningful way uh, via integer and linear programming and via balanceness. But then to get interpretable conditions, we can go for a condition like substitutes. Um, and substitutes gives you remarkable structure computation, uh, intuition, really a lot of things that you would hope for in a kind of really interesting uh, uh, model. And it turns out to be completely crucial for auction design, these substitutes. But you really can go beyond that. You really can have uh, settings in which uh, uh, agents do not have substitute valuations and yet competitive equilibrium exists. So now what I want to do is to talk about the setting with income effects, but let me pause just to ask if anyone has any more clarifying questions. Um, just uh, one announcement. So uh, I stored six minutes out of your uh, talk. So uh, uh, you have sort of 10 minutes and uh, of course, but uh, please feel free to go over it because we have like 30 minutes, uh, you know. Uh, of questions, so, super, yeah. fantastic. So if you allow me, I think I should be done in about 15, but I will, I will keep a very close eye on the time so people can have an opportunity to ask questions. So now I want to go to the setting with income effects. And let me stress this, and I will stress this again in my third lecture that the moment you think about a model that really requires that you have indivisible goods in it, it probably means that these goods are sort of quite big relative to agents' budgets, right? I mean, that's why a model would say you should really model it as an indivisible good rather than a divisible commodity. But if they're big, it seems like the natural thing to have is income effects, because then if they're a large fraction of an agent's budget, Quasi-linear utility seems like a pretty bad assumption. So in fact, indivisibility and income effects seem like very natural partners in the model. It seems like if you really don't, you know, if, 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 if you really need the indivisibility assumption, you probably also need the presence of income effects. So that's not to say that I've been misleading you for this entire lecture. I still think that the insights are extremely useful. And of course, you've seen this remarkable application of the product mix auction. But I think if you pause for a moment and think why income effects have been ruled out in much of the literature, I think it's partly tractability and convenience rather than necessarily kind of an optimal modeling choice. Now, for, of course, for a telecoms company, it might very well be that they find it very easy to borrow, um, even for large spectrum blocks, right? But if you think about the housing market, it then becomes a little bit harder to justify uh, why um, we have quasi-linear utility. So we will no longer assume that utility functions are quasi-linear. And here, Michi might get a little bit upset with me because I'm going to brush almost everything into this, into this one bullet point. It's going to assume that utility is continuous and strictly increasing in money. I'll, I'll, um, I'll specify things. And there's going to be a bunch of technical assumptions depending on which setting we actually are in. So in particular, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rule out budget constraints, uh, hard budget constraints, I should be precise, I should, hard budget constraints. And the reason for that is that the moment you introduce a hard budget constraint in conjunction with an indivisible good, you immediately get failure of competitive equilibrium. Demand is going to be discontinuous. You're going to get immediately a failure of equilibrium. And you might think all is lost, but I implore you to come back to lecture four, 
where Ravi is going to talk about how we can actually overcome this by not considering competitive equilibria, but rather than by considering stable matchings. Um, and turns out you can make a lot of progress in that setting. So here, I'm not going to give you the kind of the technical assumptions because they're going to vary too much. The only thing that I should say, and this is crucial, is that the exchange economy is no longer going to be isomorphic to a two-sided market from the point of view of equilibrium existence, okay? So I can't just sort of now transform my exchange economy to a two-sided market, I need to consider them separately. And in fact, as you will see in a moment, the results for two-sided markets versus for exchange economies in a setting with income effects are completely different, okay? So we will tell you about both of these uh, throughout the course of our lectures. So again, one unit uh, uh, of each good and agents have unit demand, um, I will also say that um, any agent is going to own at most one good. This is coming back to Mitchie's point. Um, so this, is, this will be in an exchange economy setting. So here, what I want to imagine is that I have a two-sided market. The sellers are going to own the goods and the buyers are going to demand the goods and any seller can own at most one good, but the, but the goods are in fact heterogeneous. So the, the agents really care whose who's good they, uh, they buy, but, they, but the buyers still only want to buy just one good. Now it turns out in this setting, competitive equilibrium still exists. There's no problem. And in fact, um, the, the way to see it is to run that ascending auction argument that I had already given you for the case of substitutes. It turns out that in this, um, in this um, a unit demand setting, in fact, it's, it's, uh, things are still going to uh, work out. And indeed, competitive equilibrium prices will still form a lattice, which is wonderful. Um, and in fact, the allocation rule that selects the minimum price equilibrium is going to be strategy proof for the buyers. Again, the unit demand part is going to be very important here, of course. And I would um, uh, have failed in my duties, I think, giving this lecture effectively in Japan to not mention one of the most beautiful results, I think, for this setting. And that is that it turns out that this minimum price equilibrium is in fact the only rule that is individually rational, efficient strategy proof and offers no subsidies for the losers. And this beautiful result um, is due to Shigehiro Serizawa um, and his former student, uh, Colin Mariwoto. So in a way, from the point of view of a two-sided market when agents have unit demand, really, right, this is a bit like the assignment market plus um, income effect, right? So nothing has really changed, except we, um, at, um, 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 this, um, um, you know, the presence of um, 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 income effect makes the model much more general in principle. Now, what if we had multiple uh, goods and then agents could be demanding, could have multi-good demand, well, in that case, you're going to have to start restricting preferences, okay? Of course, we already know that with multi-good demand, even in a transferable utility setting, we can get failure. And so a lot of uh, papers have restricted preferences to something that looks a bit like separability, essentially, right? So kind of like additive separability um, um, in, a, in a, um, um, a kind of usual uh, sense. But you can do a little bit better than that. In fact, what you can do is that you can create a version of substitutability for the setting with income effects. And it looks a bit like this. In a way, I think the credit still goes to Kelsen Crawford here, but the kind of more precise definition uh, was uh, uh, due to Fleiner et al. Um, and for disclosure, I am one of the et al's on this paper. So I'm a little bit biased, um, as is of course Ravi. Um, now here, what we're going to say that a utility function is a gross substitute utility function at a particular endowment if the usual condition holds. That is, if the demand of good I goes up, the demand of all the other good weekly goes up. So it's exactly the same condition as we had for substitutes valuations, except now it is in fact for a more general gross substitute utility function. Here now you can see that I'm specifying that the demand is Marshallian. And in the third lecture, I'm going to come back to this definition very strongly um, and, and, um, and tell you much more about what we can do with it. But, and so what we proved is that in fact, in a setting with income effects, in fact, in a quite a general setting, you can even have a network of interacting agents. You can in fact uh, have frictions. Uh, you, you don't even, um, uh, you can kind of have distortionary taxes. If all agents have gross substitute utility functions, in their endowments, then in fact, competitive equilibria still exist. And, uh, to give Kelsey and Crawford complete credit, we just use their argument. It looks a little bit more involved, but intuitively we did exactly the same thing as they did 
with discretized prices. We ran a very complex um, ascending or monotonic auction, I should say. Um, and um, we, we got to our equilibrium. We then took the limit and we got the equilibrium in our original economy. There was a bit of modification along the way. And actually it turned out, and there was a lovely pa recent paper by uh, Jan Christoph Schlegel, actually shows that most of the structural results I showed you about strategy proofness, lattice, and all this stuff, they still all go through, okay? So again, income effects don't really matter too much, even if um, agents have multi-good demand. But there is a trouble with gross substitutes when you have income effects. Um, and it's the following. Okay, so it turns out gross substitute is extremely restricting. So think about a buyer for a moment. Suppose that the price of good I increases. We know by uh, substitutability, gross substitutability, that demand for good K must also increase. But if you have income effects and the price of good I increases, the buyer becomes poorer. And so it means that this good K On the one hand, we require that demand goes up, and if the good is normal, now that's not great because it basically tells you that gross substitutability essentially requires that goods be inferior for the buyer, right? And so that means that actually the income effect side of gross substitutability places very strong conditions on exactly the structure of preferences that you can have. And so in lecture three, I will come back to why gross substitutability is not a very good assumption, actually, in general, it's very restrictive. And it's this combination of income and substitute effects that turns out to um, uh, be very restrictive. And so finally, <clears throat> and here's, um, I'm really nearing the end here, so thank you so much for bearing with me. I want to now think about the setting with income effects in an exchange economy setting. Now, remember what I said, it is with income effects, it's no longer isomorphic to a two-sided market. In a two-sided market, essentially, our results have all gone through. But what about an exchange economy? Well, it turns out that actually existence of equilibrium, even if you have one good and, um, and you know, possibly multiple units of it, existence of equilibrium is actually not completely trivial. And so um, uh, Claude Henry showed that, in fact, um, equilibrium exists. But let's think about a more interesting setting. Now, this is what's called the housing market. And in this housing market, very simple setting as before, it's an exchange economy. We have some agents that are endowed with a house and some agents and all agents want to end up with at most one house at the end. So in particular, one of the things I can now do is I can sell my house and buy another house. And we allow agents to have income effects, right? So they will be affected by how much money they end up with at the beginning. This exchange economy is saying our goods are gonna be heterogeneous. Now, gross substitutability here is not going to be satisfied. This is a very important point. What you can't do is you can't run these arguments that I've shown you before that relied on substitutability, like an ascending auction. Why is that the case? Well, suppose I have a house and the price of my house goes up. What I might do is I might stop demanding a mediocre house and start demanding a fancy house because I can now sell my house for a higher price and buy myself a fancier house. But this means that the price of a house has gone up and my demand for a mediocre house has gone down, which is a violation of gross substitutability. So in fact, in this model, you cannot possibly use gross substitutability uh, to argue that equilibrium exists. But remarkably, equilibrium always exists. And gross substitutability is not even remotely satisfied here. Now it turns out, that you actually need to run a topological argument to show that equilibrium still exists. And amazingly, there were three papers that appeared in the same year giving different proofs of this result. One is due to Gale, who used the KKM lemma. One due to Svensson, who used Kakotani's fixed point theorem in one of the steps. And one due to Martin Quincy, who in one of the steps used Scarf's lemma, which is, um, and so none of, these, none of these arguments were constructive in the same way as the argument for constructing a competitive equilibrium were when goods were actually substitutes, when agents had substitute valuation or their utility functions were uh, gross substitutable. So here you really do need to use another type of argument, right? A, a different type of argument. And all three papers 
um, I gave different versions of this argument under slightly different technical conditions. Um, but what I find wonderful is that they all appeared in the same year. And in fact, two of them appeared in the same issue of um, um, IJGT. So <clears throat> hopefully now you can really see that there is a, once we introduce income effects, we really do have this vast gap between a two-sided market and an exchange economy. And we're gonna have to think about these two models potentially in a very different way. And that's what we're going to do in our third and fourth lectures. Okay, so, and in particular in the third lecture, what I will do is I will give you very general and completely economically interpretable conditions that will guarantee equilibrium existence in the presence of income effect while allowing for multi-unit demand. So a very special case of our results is in fact going to be these, um, this exchange economy um, housing market model where you want at most one house in the end. Okay, but I will give you a completely general result. It will allow for multi-good demand and so on. And in fact, um, and in fact, the condition for existence or different conditions for existence are going to be easy to interpret. So let me now summarize where I've got to. So remember we had these six points, these six facts about the divisible good setting from general equilibrium. And what I now want to show you is six facts about the transferable utility setting within divisibles, typically when substitutability is assumed. And what's really fun is that every fact is now going to be different. So remember that in a divisible good setting, we needed very weak conditions for existence. In a divisible good setting, we need strong conditions. As you saw from a very simple example, you can get failure of existence of equilibrium very quickly once agents have multi-unit demand. We also get a continuum of equilibrium prices. This was in the horse model. We do not get finite and odd prices. We have structure, unlike in general equilibrium. So under substitutability, we're going to have a lattice structure of equilibrium prices, which is wonderful. It's, and it turns out that different endpoints of this lattice have wonderful properties for mechanism design. The core will coincide with competitive equilibrium. It's not going to be larger. Typically, it's going to coincide. <clears throat> and what's wonderful is if you assume something like substitutability or other, there's, there's other types of conditions. It doesn't have to be substitutability. Different types of tetonomon are going to work, right? Now, of course, remember that under gross substitutability, even in the G setting, tetonomon works as well. So in a way, this is actually almost like a parallel result. And in particular, computing equilibrium prices is going to be easy in the TU setting. This is, this is reasonably general. Now. Let me give you the roadmap of where we're going and I will actually show you why the, hopefully things are going to be striking and really I'm on my penultimate slide now. This lecture, as I said, and I apologize, I hope you accepted my apology that this was just an extended literature review, but I really wanted to put things together so you can see that there are different moving parts that can make things more or less complicated and some things sort of go against your intuition and some of the things go with your intuition. But hopefully at least now we have a good foundation for you to be truly appreciate what's going to happen in the second, uh, third and fourth lectures. So in the next lecture tomorrow, Elizabeth will tell you, take you far beyond substitutes. And those pictures that I showed you of these, of these lines that carved up the price space into where demand was single valued, they, this turns out to be a really useful way of representing preferences. And so, what we can in fact do is to link how um, the geometry of these um, of, um, um, of this picture to comparative statics of demand. And it turns out to be that there is a perfect match between comparative statics of demand and this geometry. And Elizabeth will mention that. And then she will give you this splendid result. And it's going to be this unimodularity theorem, which is going to be a necessary and sufficient condition for existence of competitive equilibrium using this representation of preferences via these demand types, via these, these lines in price space. And she will cover product mix auctions. And so <clears throat> I think uh, most of you already know the history of this, that this collaboration with Paul and Elizabeth emerged out of thinking about auctions and thinking about how one can generalize product mix auction beyond the setting of, um, of a substitutes, in fact, strong substitutes, um, and Elizabeth will, will, will talk a lot about that and ab about, in particular, about that remarkably simple bidding language where all you need to do is to place a dot in price space. And she will tell you, actually, it turns out you can do a lot with dots, um, especially if what you're interested in is substitutes. 
Then I'm afraid for the third lecture, you have me again. And what I'll do is I'll really focus on income effects in, in exchange economies. And this is very much related to the latter part of this lecture. And what I'll mention is, um, is trying to overcome this problem of gross substitutability, for example, being a very restrictive condition, right? Where the, the income effects turn out to place very strong conditions. And what we'll do is we'll actually think about Hicksian demand. Remember that demand that you've sort of covered in perhaps your first year of undergraduate or graduate economics, where you thought about utility maximization and expenditure minimization. This turned out to play a key role in what we will show you. In fact, we'll have a really nice result called the equilibrium existence duality that will link existence of equilibrium in transferable utility settings to the existence of equilibrium in income effect settings. And we'll be able to go between them and use whatever result we need that is most convenient. And that is going to be a really nice bit. We'll be able to, to really kind of leverage the best parts of both to generate new results. And I'll give you a new condition for existence of equilibrium called net substitutability, not gross substitutability, um, which, uh, which is going to be uh, rather lovely. And then in the last lecture, what Ravi will do is that he will again focus on two-sided markets, not exchange economies, but two-sided markets. And he will really tackle this thorny issue of hard budget constraints. Up till then, we will not allow for hard budget constraints. But what Ravi will show is that you can actually get stable outcomes. And you'll explain what stable means in that setting without existence of competitive equilibrium. Again, kind of striking because typically we think about stability and competitive equilibrium as coinciding in most models. And yet here you're going to have one without the other. Um, and, um, and hopefully that would be exciting too. So let me just very quickly show you really what can happen with um, once you have uh, income effects, just as a preview for why things are going to be interesting. So you've already seen that in a transferable utility indivisible good setting, everything is different from the divisible good general equilibrium case. But here in red, I've highlighted, and this is to be covered in future lectures, especially in lectures three and four, how different the income effect setting with indivisible goods is going to be different from the TU setting with indivisible goods. So while we're still going to have need strong, uh, strong conditions for existence and a continuum of equilibrium prices and the coincidence of core and competitive equilibrium, suddenly our equilibrium prices are going to lack structure again. And in fact, with hard budget constraints, we don't even have existence, but we could have, still have stable outcomes. Tatanamon is going to stop working again, and computing equilibrium prices is going to be hard again. So on the one hand, I have shown you how different the TU indivisible good setting is from general equilibrium, but once we introduce income effects, we sort of go halfway back to this general equilibrium world where still some things don't quite work, such as structure, Tatanamon, and computation. And yet, I hope to convince you, especially in the third lecture, that in fact, you can get a remarkable amount of tractability by using this tool that I will show you called the equilibrium existence duality. So I hope I'm not too much over time. Um, I've taken longer than I expected for you to, I'm sorry, but I still think there should be a good sort of 13 minutes or so for questions. Thank you very much.